Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me try and time myself. Um, just a quick thank you uh, to the organizers and the sponsors of this uh, event um, to give us <coughs> the actual opportunity to present what uh, our view is on a possibility for Greece to uh, exploit the opportunity of LNG as a short sea shipping uh, meaning. So just a very quick word, who are we? Uh, Knudy Hansen, uh, I'm the general manager for Knudy Hansen S, is the Danish uh, consultancy and design firm. We've basically, uh, for the last 77 years, been busy designing the ships that uh, drill uh, the oil and the gas, they transport it, and they use it, you know, possibly in the near future as a fuel. So, as a company, we have decided a few years ago to expand our operation here in Paris because we believe that Greece is a great shipping nation. It goes without saying for many of you which are familiar with that industry that uh, deep sea and short sea transportation are for uh, Greece part of a long maritime history and uh, part of a cultural heritage. In uh, 2014, actually, Greece, the Greek uh, merchant fleet tops again uh, the world tonnage ranking in front of countries such as Japan and China. And this is not a small undertaking. So just a quick word on, uh, if you look at this picture here, this plays shipping lanes in blue. Uh, that's quite a lot of traffic going around the world. We still, uh, my misunderstand, despite the crucial role that in the world transportation mat matrix, shipping is still uh, something which is perceived as a backward industry in terms of innovation and uh, you know, innovation values compared to other industries such as uh, aeronautic and automotive. There are changes on the way, obviously. Uh, some people are, you know, I have to remember that um, shipping actually uh, is not only the prime mover of energy, but it's actually one of the largest users. Um, deep sea vessels so far have been using uh, f f fossil uh, fuel, HFO, as you call it. Uh, in the late 70s, the quality of this fuel deteriorated as the crude oil was exploited more and more for uh, more intensely refined uh, valuable fractions. So. Shipping was encouraged to use the leftovers of this refining, and so the technology, the engines, and everything has adapted to use those leftovers. Uh, this is becoming less and less the case, as uh, you know, there is uh, some uh, sort of restrictions which come from uh, IMO and MARPOL regulations, which basically are expanding what they're called uh, uh, areas, uh, ECAs, where you basically are not allowed to trade with uh, fossil fuel. Just uh, quickly, uh, of course, in this so conservative coal industry, things are changing. People are focusing more and more on life cycle costs. We are learning that lesson. There is new technology available, and there is, of course, different energy awareness. So we were discussing earlier on about uh, regulatory frameworks and environmental issues. This is uh, one of the factors, of course, which is one of the external factors which is driving this change. And Let's spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, here you see, starting from uh, top left, 2010 to 2020, it's uh, a decade. Uh, Alpha, which, Alpha, which is already gone, actually, uh, is showing that the rules of uh, you know, using distilled uh, liquid fuel oil, uh, oils are becoming stricter as we anticipated. Uh, for those familiar, SOX and uh, NOx basically are uh, sulfate and nitrate oxygen, you know, um, leftovers from burning the fuel, and those are seen as a more and more of a problem. So they created the emission control area. You will see around the United States and part of Canada in blue, those are already implemented. All the Baltic area has already been implemented. You know, there is a, a timeline they're missing where in 2015 also the Mediterranean was supposed to become one of those areas. Fortunately, and somehow, you know, luckily, this has been postponed now for later on, perhaps in 2020, giving us a little bit more time to think how to sort out this problem. What kind of fuel can we burn with our ships and transporting our goods in the Mediterranean? Um, going back, you know, quickly to Mr. what Mr. Spanudi said about Norway and the Norwegian model, you know, we have uh, actually, as we work a lot with the Scandinavian market, uh, we are aware of uh, a tax on NOx emissions. Obviously, many of you will be uh, familiar with this. <coughs> it has been given a positive connotation. Basically, okay, who pollutes pays a tax. This goes into a fund. This fund is then reinvested back in the industry to give uh, subsides, to subsidize and give rewarding with practical reduction to people which are investing in cleaner energies. 
So, yes, we're moving to green shipping. That's basically the target. Some, somehow it's going to happen that we're going to do something good while doing uh, well. Of course, this is a cost. Um, how can we make a greener shipping? In all these equations, what I would like to concentrate on is I will skip, of course, all the technical aspects, you know, by applying specialized equipment and technical solution, smart design. All this is uh, perhaps, you know, beyond the scope of this uh, conference. But anyway, what we would like to concentrate on the fact is that HFO, this dirty oil, uh, which is the discard of refining, refining process, can be actually substituted by alternative fuels, such as LFO, compressed natural gas, and least but not last, uh, liquefied natural gas. What is LNG? It's uh, mostly methane. And this uh, chemical composition actually leads directly to very low CO2 emissions. Uh, is it cleaner than uh, HFO? Is it really cleaner? Yes, it is. It's virtually sulfur free, which means you know, there is no uh, sulfur emission. And also the nitrous oxygen emissions are very low and also the particulate matter which is emitted by combustion of LNG is very low. It looks also clean. It doesn't make that nasty black smoke that people and the public opinion doesn't like. Is it cheaper? This is a matter of, uh, of course, discussion. Uh, but if we put it in a very pragmatic way and synthesize very quickly, if you run uh, a short sea shipping operation, just to give you an example, one of your Greek ferries on uh, LNG, or rather dual fuel, which is LNG and diesel oil for the next 25 years, you're going to have a saving on the OPEX of about 50%. That's the, your bill cost will go down by 50%. So that makes it pretty much a no-brainer, even though we don't know how much the price of LNG will be strictly linked or to the one of oil in the near future. Some of you surely are more qualified than me to say that. <clears throat> uh, is it dangerous? There is also a perception, especially in uh, local markets, you know, which of course has been under a lot of discussion in Scandinavia, uh, this sounds to be dangerous. People associate gas with risks simply because we're not familiar with it. Actually, this industry in land-based and uh, marine uh, operation has a very viable uh, safety record. If you think that hundreds of thousands of trips on LNG carriers have taken place around the world in the last 40 years and no single relevant accidents have been reported. Not in terms of safety, not in terms of security. So, Naturally, shipping in the last 15 years, and this is very recent, has been moving towards LNG. Uh, according to market intelligence, there's going to be more and more. Currently, we have about 100 vessels worldwide which operate purely on LNG. The prediction by you know, market intelligence sources is that by in the next uh, five to six years, that number will be a tenfold. So it will be about thousands of them. Uh, all the big engine constructors such as Varsila, uh, MBAW, and all the other guys are already geared up. The technology is available. Uh, a bit slower in terms of, uh, we're moving a bit slower in terms of what the infrastructure to fill up our ships with LNG, how that is developing. Uh, we will say a bit more of that later. Again, going to the Norwegian and Scandinavian case, in the last five years they invested in only Norway in the region of three billion US dollars. Uh, for distribution and capillarity of distribution for their vessels. So it requires money. So wh where, where is Greece in all this? You know, what's happening in the Mediterranean? The Mediterranean, as we said before, most likely in 2020 will be allocated the denomination of ECA, uh, Emission Control Area again. Uh, there is an opportunity there. So it's time for changes and um, of course, this creates a, a need for uh, improved frame conditions and closer cooperation between parties, especially in the transportation of sea freight. There is a lot of talking in the last 10 to 15 years. You know, the Greeks, the Italians, and all the other guys in the, in the Mediterranean have been discussing the motorways of the sea. And that's a very important concept. We have to take goods out of our roads and put them on ships. We are living in a very nice environment to do that. Plus, that will boost our business, obviously. And Greece, of course, uh, with the gas discoveries in Cyprus and Israel, apart from, of course, the competing Russian uh, share, uh, you know, the lion share, which is, uh, you know, sort of uh, wiggly at the moment, um, Greece and the Southeast, uh, Southeastern Europe actually have a chance. Uh, this opens, of course, uh, opportunities for the geographical position, but also, as it was mentioned before, as a possibility of using Greece as an energy hub. So. The kind of ships that use LNG are pretty much all of them, and we will not go through. Some of those are very familiar to you, mostly row packs, container vessels, tankers, 
uh, row rows. Um, if we look at this, and if we think what kind of ships are perfect candidate to be using LNG as a form of fuel, that is actually those ones you see there, row row ships, row packs, and container vessels. Um, because they need small quantities of LNG, and that makes the technology more accessible. So that's why short sea shipping is the key. And guess what? There is a, if we want to just break the market, one of them, to give a very quick, a simple example, Greece has a very large uh, fleet of Ropax vessels. These are uh, what we so-called ferries. Uh, this fleet is pretty much aging and soon will be obsolete. So with the new regulations, most of those ships will have to be put out of business. There is a lot of short sea voyages coming between uh, Greece and the domestic routes and the islands, and also, of course, the Mediterranean trade with Italy and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll expand it also to Spain and France. There is a close proximity, as we heard today, and we hear more later in the day, to hot gas project developments. So, and there is a strategic location issue. So these ships, of course, if you want to propel them with LNG, they're going to have a slightly higher extra cost of construction. To give you an order of magnitude, about 10% of the total construction of a new vessel of this kind will go into implementing LNG technology for, for the tanks, for the systems, and all the space. The, these prices will drop simply because there is more and more people investing and manufacturing, and right now just a very few brave guys are moving in that direction, and very few of those in the Mediterranean, actually almost none, all this is happening in Scandinavia, in North America, and in Canada, and is happening today. So I think we should learn from, you know, try not to reinvent the wheel and see what people are doing. The technology is proven, so is there available. This is how you fill your ships, if that's an LNG-powered vessel, so I borrowed this picture from uh, the net. I apologize for not putting any reference, hope not offend anybody. But uh, you can fill up your ships at a, a bunkering terminal, you know, by using the pipe or you can use a, a little track to come alongside your ship. We're talking about smaller quantity of LNG than you would have of uh, HFO in the short sea shipping routes. And then you have portable tanks, but also the vessel to vessel transfer. So this is opening again, new business idea, new opportunities for Greece. And what do the terminals look like? Uh, they can be onshore and they can be offshore. Both of them have their pros and cons, of course, Onshore terminals have a higher uh, um, capex, is a higher investment, uh, whereas it's been uh, actually um, proven by some, some category studies from Shell that if you process and store your LNG offshore, and Revitusa somehow is that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of option, you can actually save a lot of money, up to 30 to 50% cheaper option. So all is to be done there is massive. Basically, is to develop an industry, an LNG cluster. So we mentioned the, the Norwegian example. Somebody else mentioned the Spanish example. It requires a lot of research and development and international cooperation to push for regulations, safety and, uh, and economic, of course. Um, there is a need, of course, for support and funding. Um, imagine that in the Greek case, specifically, most of those routes we are talking about, these are subsidized routes. So if the government decides to invest in you know, pushing owners and operators to invest in this sort of technology, it's going to have a direct payback. And then, of course, the control on price and distribution. So I think this is for somebody else to discuss more in detail. I cannot forecast the price of LNG, but uh, there is opportunities and challenges. So some food for thought. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Now, we heard a lot of very interesting things.